As many of you probably know by now, I'm trying to um, establish a new way of looking at the scriptures, one which will you know, open the door to understanding the true mystery that was handed down to us by the apostles and through Jesus Christ. And um, as you know, I have usually um, broached the subject um, in discussions of the epistle of Jude and also um, Second Peter. Jude, because the thesis goes, um, there is a faith that he says that we're trying to fight for and as he goes to explain about this faith that we are trying to fight for, he uses a lot of uh, non-canonical sources. And so basically, um, in a nutshell, the, what you can gather from that is that these non-canonical sources that he keeps citing are in fact a part of this faith that we are supposed to be fighting for. And just to prove it then, um, you go to the um, second book of Peter which is written around the book of Jude, which is written around these non-canonical sources, and uh, basically takes Jude under his, uh, um, under his wings, so to speak, and um, goes ahead and says, you know, things like, uh, um, that you must understand this most of all, or first of all, that no prophecy of scripture ever came about by, you know, prophet's own interpretation, but um, ancient people in ages past, or the prophets of ages past, wrote as they were moved along by the Holy Spirit. So this is um, with reference to um, his defense of the book of Jude, because presumably the people brought Jude to um, Peter and said, should we be reading Enoch? Because Jude said, you know, we should be reading Enoch, apparently. And Peter, understanding that as part of the mystery that's on the one hand supposed to be lost, and on the other hand supposed to be found, um, uh, can't answer that question in a very straight, direct way. He has to answer it in such a way that whoever understands this in the future understands this in a very straight way. You know, um, that is kind of given, you know, in an indirect sort of way. The answer basically is this. Yes, um, you are supposed to read these books, but the mystery is supposed to be lost and found. Uh, but what I will do is I will make it so that I can, I can remind you of this in the future. And he even says this in Second Peter. You know, I'll make sure that, you know, after my departure, you will be able to remember these things, right? So it's a process of recollection. And I'm just telling you that that's what that recollection is, is that, you know, we basically dropped the ball when it came to uh, Enoch and the Assumption of Moses and presumably a whole bunch of other apocryphal books as well. But then Peter takes, you know, takes Jude to himself, defending Jude, and thereby, by extension, defending Enoch in this mystery, then goes and says, you know, you have no right to question this, these people of ages past, and since Jude to him was not ages past, he must be referring to Enoch and the author of the Assumption of Moses in that particular statement, and he's defending them. And um, he said that they weren't, you know, they, didn't, they, weren't, um, they weren't just writing off their own heads, they weren't just writing to please themselves. In other words, they were inspired, they were moved along by the Holy Spirit, so he's saying, yes, those books are inspired. And he then goes on to say, um, after, you know, dealing with the book of Jude, you know, by quoting most of it, uh, off in chapter 3, he talks about, um, but these people that have crept into the church, presumably the people who question the authority of these books, um, the people that are doubting these things, um, he basically says, but look, Paul talks about all this stuff in all of his letters too, the very same thing that I'm talking about, he says, and um, then he goes on to say, but these people, um, you know, twist these scriptures, they twist these words to their own destruction. And so, so long as we um, align ourselves with these people who don't understand this mystery, we too are, you know, to be, you know, sort of like these sacrificial animals, these brute beasts, only to be caught and destroyed, that we're under their curse. But, you know, that the day will come, and a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. Therefore, the two thousand years that have passed are the two days, you know, Jesus, the Logos, in other words, rises up on the third day. It means that this mystery is, you know, um, understood on the third day when Paul says, you know, but do not be ignorant of this fact that a day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years are as a day. Uh, the Lord is not slow when it comes to, you know, keeping his promise, but he's being patient with us and not wanting, you know, anyone to, you know, um, to be destroyed or whatever, wanting everybody to be saved. But the critical issue here is he takes, 
he takes that question, should we be reading these books in Jude, and answers them in such a way that you can understand it that way, but obviously we haven't understood it in that way, so it's for a future time, which I believe is now, is upon us. Um, you know, then he goes on and he says, look, this is the same way that Paul writes in his, you know, letters, and that, you know, they twist these words as they do the other scriptures. And so presumably, this teaching should flow through Paul and John and Matthew and all the other New Testament um, New Testament books, and presumably the Old Testament as well, um, because he says all of the other scriptures. So um, basically, I'm moving on from Jude and from Peter now, and into the letter, um, the second and third letters of John, with that same idea. And so, because I'm testing a thesis, or because I'm demonstrating, you know, the applicability of this thesis to these other books, I need you to bear in mind that um, I'm gonna that everything that I say and everything that I do is with reference to this thought that these things are written back in those days and in those times for us to understand in these days and these times and that everything is to be understood in retrospect as that having been the original meaning but that we have you know subjected ourselves to these people who have crept into the church as Jude and Peter both talk about and so we're to take that lens that Peter actually tells us to take and apply it to the other scriptures and so we're just simply doing what Peter is you know asking us to do and that is to take this out and, and, and to apply it to, you know, Paul and to the other scriptures. And so that's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to demonstrate that in the second letter of John and the third letter of John, we have this very same, um, um, this very same message. Um, so I'm going to exegete it like that or interpret it like that. Now, first of all, um, I like this book. It's called the New Testament and Other Christian Writings, which is actually very good, and I like the translations in this book. But it actually is composed of um, not only the four canonical Gospels, um, but also, for example, the Infancy Gospels, like the Infancy Gospel of Thomas, not only the Acts of the Apostles, but also um, yeah, um, Paul's writings and a few of the uh, apocryphal writings, like um, Third. Corinthians, for example, which is supposedly written by Paul, and, you know, the letter of the Hebrews, for example, but also um, the epistle of Barnabas and the epistles of Ignatius. It's very nice, you know, well-rounded, you know, first, second century sources here. Um, but in this particular, bearing that in mind, kind of give you an idea of who's writing this introduction, kind of open-minded, objective people, um, I'll just go ahead and read the introduction. It says, unlike 1 John, the book of 2 John is an actual epistle sent by someone who calls himself the elder to an unnamed person called the elect lady. Because in this course, of, in the course of his letter, the author stops speaking to his lady and begins addressing a group of people, you in plural, starting in verse 6. Many scholars assume that the term elect lady refers to a Christian community that understands itself to be chosen to God. So again, even the scholars kind of understand that this is a parable. And says the issues and concerns of this letter are closely aligned with those of 1 John, as are the vocabulary and writing style, leading most scholars to conclude that they were written by the same author, prob um, probably to the same community. Here, too, is a concern over deceivers and antichrists who deny that Jesus has come in the flesh. Here, too, is an emphasis on the need for those within the community to love one another by keeping God's commandments. The author strongly opposes those who do not share his views in such matters, insisting that the community show no hospitality to anyone who takes a contrary position. He concludes by indicating his eagerness to join the congregation soon and by sending greetings from its elect sister, that is presumably his own Christian community. Um, like 1 John, the book was probably produced after the fourth gospel, sometime near the end of the first century. Notice, though, some interesting features here about this. First of all, there is the elect lady, and there is the elect sister. Now, in the context of this letter, okay, and in the context of the way a scholar would look at this, this is simply one church writing to another. He, as the uh, leader or the spokesman for this one church, and the elect lady as being a neighboring church or some kind of, you know, related church over here, uh, which is overseen by... Um, let me see. 
well, it doesn't give a name here, but anyway, it's it's it it's to the the church or the congregation or whatever. So it isn't much of a stretch to stop and think about this in terms of Paul's template of forgetting and remembering, of understanding this mystery as the losing and finding, or the you know um, um, us in the future as being the true recipients of this word. Uh, if we, as the elect lady, um, a see see that particular interpretation as the congregation of the elect, right? In other words, the elect of that time, knowing the mystery, in other words, only the elect understand the mystery uh, in either age, this age or that age. Um, they're the ones who pass this mystery down in these scriptures, which are thus twisted and you know improperly used by people uh, who don't understand them, and ultimately recognized and recalled according to Peter's template in the future, if we just apply this template here, then the elect lady refers to the Christian congregations at the end of time. Um, so let me go ahead and just dive on in to the letter. You know, uh, it's very short. Again, like I said before, Jude is short. Second Peter is short. Second and Third John are both short. Philemon, which is a letter I'm going to get into, uh, is also quite short. Um, and those are because they, they contain the mystery in a very um, in a very compact succinct, um, easy to communicate, easy to demonstrate kind of way. And uh, they're very useful for that reason. And also because they tend to be relegated uh, by the um, Christian communities. They tend not to be read. Uh, and if they are, they're given kind of this, you know, quick type treatment. You know, they're not really delved into that much, um, typically. Uh, they're sort of overlooked, and that's so that the mystery can remain sort of below the radar. Uh, they don't really, you know, God doesn't really want to draw attention to, um, you know, something that might give it away. He wants this secret to really work and to really have its effect. Uh, so anyway, it says, to the elder lady and her children, or to the elect lady and her children. Um, so that would be the church at the end of time. Right, and you know, those that she gives birth to, or you know, the people that she teaches, or the people that she's over. It says, Whom I love in the truth. And not only I, but also all who know the truth. Because of the truth that abides in us and will be uh, with us forever. So, again, what is this truth? This truth is that, um, that there are these. Um, not only just these apocryphal gospels, but there's these keys to the kingdom. There's this knowledge. Everything is encoded in a certain way, and you have to read it in terms of those codes, um, which I'll get into after this series. But anyway, it says, Grace, mercy, and peace uh, will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son in truth and love. Um, okay, so in other words, through the... Through the um, the vehicle of truth and love, in other words, um, in, in speaking the truth and ser searching things out truthfully uh, and sharing that truth freely through that love that you have for the others, we will be the recipients of grace and mercy and peace. So mercy and peace are coming as a function of truth and love. It says, I was overjoyed to find some of your children walking in the truth. Again, this is at the end of time where these people are, you know, um, walking in this truth. In other words, they're, they're, re, um, they're reacquainted with the mystery. It says, just as we have been commanded by the Father. By now, dear lady, I ask you, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but one which he had from the beginning. Let us love one another. Okay, um, and this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you heard it from the beginning. You must walk in it. Many deceivers have gone out into the world. Again, these are the people that have crept in. Jude talks about them. Uh, Peter refers to them. Paul obviously talks about them. And now we have John talking about them. They've gone out into the world. Those who do not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Be on your guard so that you do not lose what we have worked for, but may receive a full reward. Everyone who does not abide in the teaching of Christ, but goes beyond it, does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Do not receive into the house or welcome anyone who comes to you and does not bring this teaching. 
For the welcome, for to welcome is to participate in the evil deeds of such a person. Although I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk with you face to face, so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister send their greetings. Okay, so he and his congregation, from then at that time, uh, speaking to us in our congregation here in this time, across time, is describing the same phenomenon that Peter and Jude are both talking about. So it, it should be clear at this point that if the infiltrators spoken of by Peter and Jude are these who deny the mysteries of God but speak their own theologies, their own myths, in other words, uh, they, they exalt themselves above the mystery of God and above the mystery of the scriptures, and they try to, um, they try to subordinate the truth to their own whims, to their own ways, right, and try to pass this off as truth or whatever, um, that this is what he's talking about here. Notice the um, the um, the development here. Um, that the ch that some of our children were walking in the truth. In other words, it's funny that he says some of your children because this is this is something that's uh, you know you would think that all of your children were walking in the truth, uh, but he's saying no. Some of your children are walking in the truth. That means some are and some are not. Uh, so notice what he's saying here. This is. This is sort of at the time of awakening, when some people are seeing this, and some people still are not. And he says, um, just as we have been commanded by the Father, in other words, that these people are walking in the truth as it has been passed down or commanded by the Father. By now, dear lady, I ask you, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but one which we had from the beginning. Let us love one another. So this is with the reference to some that are still walking, in, that are not still not walking in truth, and some which are still walking in truth. That the people that are not walking in truth need to be persuaded. They need to be comforted in terms of this. They need to be shown in a um, positive way, uh, in a happy and joyful way, uh, through truth and through love. In other words. Um, so that we can all have peace and mercy and receive the grace of God. And he says, And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. Um, this is the commandment just as you have heard it from the beginning. You must walk in it. So what he's saying here is, and what is the commandment? What did Jesus say were the two commandments? Love God with your whole heart, spirit, and strength, and to love your neighbor as you do yourself. Okay. So those are the great and overriding commandments. So again, this is with reference to how we should walk. We should walk in truth. We should walk in love. Uh, it says, many deceivers have gone out into the world. And again, he underscores the fact that this is what we had from the beginning. So in other words, he's saying, look, this is what I taught, and this is what you should be uh, understanding and accepting. Anyway, it says, many deceivers have gone out into the world. Those who do not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Uh, any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Now, by flesh, what, what he means is that, okay, Jesus did come down in the flesh. Now, there have been people who have said, and continue to say, as a matter of fact, to this day, that Jesus wasn't actually a real person, or if he did come down, he came down as something other than man. That we are to understand as uh, God as filling all things, that the... Um, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Um, it's very interesting that um, in John, first letter of John, um, in chapter five, verse six, um, the way that the way that he puts it here is very interesting because he says, um, um, "This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with water only, but with the water and the blood." And the Spirit is the one that testifies, for the Spirit is truth. There are three that testify, um, the Spirit and the water and the blood. These And these three agree. And um, one of the variations of this, um, let's see if I can find it here. Um, there are three that testify in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one, um, which is interesting because... You have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then you have Father, Word, and Holy Spirit. Jesus being the Word. 
So we understand that Jesus came down as the Word, but also as the Son, or also as the man. That, um, that God took on a physical form means that he very much um, embodies the physical reality. And um, he actually was a living, walking, talking, breathing human being in this world. Unlike what some of the Gnostics taught, which was that, you know, he was just, you know, the appearance of, you know, you know man or something like that. He actually was uh, a man. Uh, people that deny his humanity, of course, uh, are Antichrist. Uh, but at the same time, it's very interesting that the same author uses the word Father, uh, the Word, and the Holy Spirit uh, to underscore the fact that Jesus is not only the man, uh, but also the Word. Uh, and I explain this also in some of my other tracks about how if you take Jesus in um, the Gospel of John uh, as a parable of, um, it says, okay, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And um, later on it says, the Word became flesh and lived among us. Um, so um, the Word becoming flesh and living among us or whatever, uh, is symbolic of the fact that what Jesus did in the flesh, he did as a living parable of the Word. Uh, so you have to look at Jesus in the flesh, and you have to look at what Jesus did as a man uh, in order to understand what was done uh, as a parable of the Word. In other words, Jesus the man comes down out of heaven, the Word comes down out of heaven. Uh, Jesus uh, speaks to... Um, you know, people and chooses disciples as a man, then Jesus, as the Word, also speaks to the people and chooses his disciples. And um, as uh, the religious authorities basically became jealous of Jesus the man, the religious authorities also became jealous of Jesus the Word or the Logos. Um, so it's very critical to think of him in terms of his humanity in order to understand his significance as the Word or the Logos. And I think that's why John uses both images here, to let you know that Jesus, yes, is the Son, but Jesus also is the, um, the Word. Um, and um, in any case, um, but there are people out there who were saying that Jesus was, no, he was, he was only God. No, he was God and man, or that uh, he was just an appearance or something. No, he was very real. In other words, he does have power over this material realm. He does, in fact, um, he does, in fact, embody the perfect human being, or we humans as we are. And I think that's also something that we need to understand. Jesus promised that we will be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So, if he was not really a man, then we could not hope to be like him in our flesh. You know. And so I think he's also kind of letting us know that anybody who tells you that you cannot be like Jesus or that you cannot embody that it's the same qualities of Jesus. You cannot, you cannot embrace what he was, that he was the son of man, and he showed us what we would be, you know, in terms of, of um, uh, what humankind would become because of him, because of what we were capable of, or what was implanted inside of us uh, as men, will now be born into a new kind of man or a son, if you will, of man, or an evolution of man, or an offshoot of man. That's what the son of man is, and that's why Jesus was saying, look, look at me, I am you, you can be like me. So I think that's what he means, and I think these antichrists are essentially denying this, and they're saying, no, you are just a man, God is completely above you, Jesus wasn't like you, you were not like him, right? You are small, and he is great. You know, you are nothing and he is something. See, I think they invert that. And that's where he gets the idea of the Antichrist. The Antichrist are the people who invert that message. That Jesus, as a man, showed us what the Son of Man would be. And uh, for that reason, what we would then become uh, upon this realization. And, um, and it says, Be on your guards that you do not lose what we have worked for, but may receive a full reward. So as a consequence, the full reward would be... Um, the understanding of this mystery and uh, basically the taking over of the world. It says, everyone who does not abide in the teaching of Christ but goes beyond it does not have God. And you can see why that is. Because if you if you go around telling people exactly what it is, you know, that Jesus uh, represents us in terms of what we will become or what we will have the power to do, 
um, if we if we're not actually if we're not actually teaching people that that's that that's the love that God showed us, you see, the people's visions won't be you know uh, towards the greatness or the or the potential that God gave us, but it will be more towards guilt and shame and um, that kind of thing, and that arises out of going beyond this teaching, going beyond this vision of God. Um, and so he's referring to their theologies and their teachings. Whoever goes beyond this basic principle that Jesus was a man and that we are men and that we can be like Jesus, in other words, um, uh, does not have God. But whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Right? It says, do not receive into the house or welcome anyone who comes to you and does not bring this teaching. For to welcome is to participate in the evil deeds of such a person. So in other words, if you start to um, if you start to even acknowledge these people, and say you know um, things like uh, you know God is um, how should I say it? He's totally different from you, and you are sinful, and you are evil, and whatever, and starts tearing you down like the church did to people, and still does to people. By the way, you know just the, the sheer fact that you say that God is something apart from me and other than other than me. And, you know, I cannot be in touch with God or whatever. That automatically brings a separation from God. You have to show people the truth of such a thing. And it says, you know, if you do that, then you're a participator in their evil. He says, although I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I um, hope to come to you and talk to you with you face to face, so that our joy may be complete. Now, what he's saying here, I believe, Paul talks about how the letter kills but the Spirit gives life. Um, John, in both of these letters, Second and Third John, both uses um, both in both of those letters. He he says um, that I would not, you know, wish to speak with you, you know, using pen and ink, but I hope to come and see you face to face. What he's trying to say is, look, I don't want to talk to you in an explanatory way, like through a letter. All right, I really want to look into your eyes. I want to look into your soul. Right? He's making this distinction. He's saying, look, I'm not in this letter. All right. But I'm behind this letter. If you understand what this letter says, then you have this corresponding understand of the idea that lies behind it, you know, which I am trying to impart to you. And once you get the idea that these little letters do not contain me, right, but that I am, you know, that I am something deeper and far more um, important behind this letter, right, then, you know, when that time comes, in that day, in other words, when we realize this, we will see him face to face. And that's what he's saying. And he says, so that our joy may be complete. In other words, his purpose is in line with our purpose. Our purpose is to find the mystery, and his purpose is to give it to us. And when those two ideas come together, and when those two uh, events actually happen and take place, then yes, that is when we are looking him in the face. And it says, the children of your elect sister send you their greetings. And, um, you know, so that's like saying, look, these, you know, congregation or whatever there uh, is now in line with this congregation over here. And, you know, now they can, you know, be as one, as it were. Now let me move on to Third John. Again, I'll read the introduction to this before I move into the letter. It says, like Second John, the book of Third John is a real letter. It was evidently written by the same author. Rather than addressing the entire Christian community, however, here the author is addressing uh, an individual within it, a man named Gaius. It appears that Gaius has shown some hospitality to a group of traveling Christians, and it says parenthetically missionaries, possibly sent by the author himself, and the author is writing to express his gratitude. At the same time, the letter reveals a serious bit of tension in Gaius's Christian community. Uh, for another leader named Diotrephes has refused to receive these visitors and has defamed the author of the letter himself. It remains unclear whether Gaius and Diotrephes were heads of different house churches within the same community or were instead leading spokespersons within the same church. In any event, the author commends to Gaius another of his envoys, Demetrius, possibly as the one bearing the letter. 
and, and as in Second John, he concludes by expressing his desire to visit soon and by sending greetings from members of his own church. Okay, so let me just dive right into the word here. Again, use the same template that I was telling you about. Peter says, look, the same things that I'm writing to you in my letter, you need to apply them to Paul, and you need to apply them to the other scriptures. So I don't think that I'm out of line here by saying, listen, if Peter, Peter wrote in such a way as to commend these scriptures to us, to commend this understanding to us, to give us as a template, you know, his own understanding of the question, are these scriptures actually supposed to be read? Are we supposed to believe them? If we take that whole template into account and apply it to this, then this is kind of how we can, uh, that how we can um, kind of, you know, interpret this. It's much the same as in Second John, where you have the um, elder writing to Gaius again from this age to this age, right, by means of uh, Demetrius, and there are two um, two types of leaders, church leaders in this particular. Uh, at the end of the age. There are those who believe it and embrace it, and there are those who block it and question it and, um, you know, threaten people. And you can see that as the conflict that's coming, that there will be some pastors, some Christians who will believe this, and some pastors and some Christians who will not believe it and will suppress it and will act actively um, fight it. And so Demetrius, or the go-between, or whatever, you could interpret that on several different levels. Well, I'll get into that. It says, now the elder to the blood to the beloved Gaius, uh, whom I love in truth. Again, we have truth and love, right? Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you, and that you may be in good health, just as it is well with your soul. So one thing we know about Gaius is that his soul is well, and that um, he's praying that he also be well in the flesh. And it says, I was overjoyed when some of the friends arrived and testified to your faithfulness to the truth. Namely, how you walk in the truth. Um, I have no greater joy than this, than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. So Gaius is one who was taught by John, you know, because he is his child. It says, Beloved, do you faithfully whatever you do for the friends, and the friends are supposedly, um, let's see, brothers, yeah, even though they are strangers to you, they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on in a manner worthy of God. For they began their journey for the sake of Christ, accepting no support from non-believers. Therefore, we ought to support such people, so that we may become co-workers with the truth. I have written something to the church. It seems to me like he's written something here. Um, now, before, these people who were of no use or whatever, I'll get back to that. It says, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. Why? Whose authority does he acknowledge then? It's a very interesting question because this is supposedly John. And even if it isn't John the Evangelist, I mean, this is someone who would later become canonized in our scriptures. You know? And so who is this Diotrephes? Well, apparently it says... Um, it says, he does not acknowledge our authority. So if I come, I will call attention to what he is doing in spreading false charges against us. And not content with those charges, he refuses to welcome the friends and even prevents those who want to do so and expels them from the church. Now this is saying quite a mouthful here, so let me break it apart. It says, Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first. All right. So, again, at the end of time we have Gaius, and at the end of time we have Diotrephes. These are the two competing types of church. And right now, Diotrephes is like 100%. Given time, you will find uh, Gaius, the Gaius type, emerging. All right? But the first letter was kind of to um, the elect lady, or the church at the end of the age. So you have this, these parishioners changing, that some of them were walking in the truth, and some of them were walking. You see what I'm saying? So, among the parishioners in the second letter of John, I mean, um, some of them were walking in truth and some of them apparently were not. And the letter of third John, which is to leadership rather than to the laity, as second John primarily, uh, you have this emerging figure of Gaius, who is, you know, um, his soul is in health. In other words, his soul has been saved, in other words, he's received salvation. And then you have Diotrephes, who obviously has not. So Diotrephes, who likes to have the self preeminence or whatever, is the bad guy, then cor the corollary to that is that Gaius, in order to achieve his wellness, 
has to forego the self and put himself last and be embracing of John, the elder, uh, and his message and the truth, and thereby become a child of his, and in, then to be in health. So, but in, in, in a nutshell, 3 John is to the leadership, and 2 John is to the laity, more or less. And it says, not content with those charges. Oh, he's, I'm um, sorry, he's call it, wait, wait, let me back up. He does not acknowledge our authority, all right? So in other words, if, um, if, you, if you say that the authority that he's talking about here is um, the authority of truth, you see, the authority of being, you know, his actual, by virtue of his being correct, uh, by authority of the fact that he is in line with Peter's template, you see, of how he should write his letter and what, you know, the structure and the meaning behind the, the scriptures and the way that they are written and encoded, you know, to be decoded later. You see, if that authority isn't enough for Diotrephes, which it's not, it says, when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing and spreading false charges against us, right? So this is what this letter, in fact, does by showing the Diotrephes type, the people who are currently in the church now, by saying, look, these people are false. These people are leading you astray. They have led you astray. And if they continue to exalt themselves, then they are the Diotrephes type. If they then repent and become a child and accept my authority, the authority of the elder, right, then they become the gayest type, right? And so this represents the conflict that comes at the end of this. And um, to just, just to say that it's false, in other words, the false charges that he's laying against us is to simply say, look, if these people are denying it, they're liars. You see, and not content with those charges, he refuses to welcome the friends and even prevents those who want to do so and expels them from the church. In other words, he does not want these people coming into his church. He's going to be like, you know what? You stay out. You understand me? You, you are not a Christian. You are a heretic. You stay out of my church. And if any one of you wants to bring these people into this church, I will kick you out as well. And that's going to be the attitude of the church in the last days. Okay, but then he goes on. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but imitate what is good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Okay, so what he's saying is, what should we do? How should we, how should we act? If to... If Gaius is the good person, he is accepting of these friends. And Diotrephes is the bad person, and he is not accepting of these friends. He's saying, accept these friends, right? The friends of these messengers, these people coming to him to tell them this message. You know, missionaries at the end of time, uh, who are bringing this word, who are bringing this message of the truth of the kingdom. And he's saying, don't imitate Diotrephes, imitate Gaius. Okay? Um... And whoever is imitating Gaius, in other words, has not um, seen God because they have not seen the truth, right? And they do not have the Spirit. God is Spirit and truth. It says, everyone has testified favorably about Demetrius, and so has the truth itself. We also testify for him. And you know that our testimony is true. So Demetrius apparently is the messenger here. I have much to write to you, but I would rather not write it with pen and ink. Instead, I hope to see you soon, and we will walk, um, talk together face to face. So in other words, again, pen and ink is what's on the page, right? People have been looking at pen and ink since the letter was written, but have we looked at him face to face? No, we have not seen the mystery here. We have not, un we have not applied the template so generously given to us by Peter, who was given the keys to the kingdom, all right? And he was given the power to lock up what no man could unlock and to unlock, you see, on earth what was in heaven, right? So Peter has that key, okay? So I think we have it on pretty good authority. And it says, um, Instead, I hope to see you soon, and we will talk together face to face. In other words, what we say and what he says will be in line, you see? And it says, Peace to you. The friends send you their greetings. Um, greet the friends there, each by name. Okay. So anyway, those are those are the two letters of Second and Third John. Two letters that have basically been ignored, relegated to the little you know backwater you know uh, sections of the New Testament. Um, 
And like I said before, I mean, if you really, really want to know the mystery of God, you really got to go to, you know, the 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 ends of the roads. You really got to go all the way down and, and pick the lowest of the low and the least of the least and the last of the last. And you have to, you have to start from there. Um, you have to start with what may be the least important. Jesus says, look, if you're if you're trustworthy in little things, then you can be trusted with big things. Okay, and what he means by that is don't go to the most exalted, uh, the most used parts of the scripture uh, to find this mystery. You got to look for it. It's buried. You got to dig it up, right? It's hidden. You got to go and find it, right? It's lost. You know, you got to find it. Uh, you got to uh, you got to um, wait for it. You know, in that day, you know the words will be given to you. There's all these elements to this mystery, and that's what the mystery is.